Welcome to another edition of Thunderdome. Today, <clears throat> we start Unit 5, and uh, Unit 5 is going to have two chapters in it. Uh, and our first chapter is Chapter 6, and it deals with memory, which you'll learn, which uh, really can't be trusted uh, <clears throat> as much as you think it can be. So, uh, what is memory? Um, mental processes that enable you to retain and retrieve information over time. It's not a single process, so certain things have to happen for memory to even exist. So, uh, three fundamental processes. Encoding, storage, and retrieval. Uh, encoding is pretty simple, you just think about the word, but it's getting things, information into your brain. So the process of transforming information into a form that can be entered into and retained by the memory system. Um, this is really important. Uh, encoding, you would think of the hippocampus. Uh, so the hippocampus is a you know, structure of the limbic system, and it is really heavily tied into forming new memories. Um, if the hippocampus is destroyed, you will no longer be able to form new memories. So uh, then we have storage, uh, the process of retaining information and memory so they can be used at a later time. And then retrieval. So you don't have a memory unless you can you know, get it out. I mean, that memory is just going to exist in your head, but you can't get it out. So the process of recovering information stored in memory so that we are consciously aware of it. So that's pretty much our system of memory uh, in its simplest form. So we have incoming sensory information. We encode it. Okay, we get it ready and convert it for storage. Uh, then information is retained in memory, uh, storage, and then retrieval information is recovered from the memory when needed. If any one of these processes fails, memory will, will fail. Um, I think there's something you have to realize too as a human, that you forget more than you remember. Um, and you don't necessarily like to think about that, um, but it's true. You would forget more than you remember um, you know, except if you, you know, have a certain disorder, which we'll talk about at the very end, where you can't forget anything. Um, you become OCD about memories. Uh, all right, so the stage model of memory. Uh, this is uh, also called the atkinson schifrin model of memory, so you might see it like that as well. Uh, but a model describing a memory uh, describing memory as consisting of three distinct stages. Sensory memory, which it comes in through the senses. Uh, Short-term memory, which we can hold for a very short period of time. And then long-term memory, which happens to be limitless amounts of information. Um, so, <clears throat> again, we can see it here. Sensory memory, okay, these would be your eyes, ears, touch, all that kind of stuff. The transfer into short-term memory. Uh, and at this moment, you can probably think to yourself, um, okay, I need to remember this. And then if you think about that, you're probably entering into rehearsal, which is maintenance rehearsal. And if you keep on working with this enough, it actually gets transferred into long-term memory, um, which again, I said was limitless. So sensory memory. Um, so the first stage of the atkinson schifrin model of memory. So this stage of memory registers information from the environment and holds it for a very brief period of time. So environmental information is registered, large capacity for information, but the duration is short. So one fourth of a second to three seconds. And usually whenever you decide to remember something, it has to do something, it has to you know, do something with sound or sight. Uh, so think of your sensory memory as an internal camera that continuously takes snapshots of your surroundings even with hearing. So with each snapshot, you momentarily focus your attention on specific details. Almost instantly, the snapshot fades only to be replaced by another one. And we'll see this in these two different types of sensory memory that we're going to cover, which is iconic and echoic memory. Um, iconic is keeping a brief image or an icon in your sensory memory through your visual system. Uh, so the visual sensory memory. Uh, so your visual sensory memory typically holds an image of your environment for about one quarter to one half second before it is replaced by yet another overlapping snapshot. Again, we're humans and we kind of have a frame rate, okay? 
So, you know, really high frame rates are awesome to watch videos on, right? 60 frames per second. I think your iPhone can do that. But it usually uh, records on 30 frames per second. Um, but to demonstrate this, we'll wave something back and forth, okay? So when I wave this back and forth, if you're here present in this room, you can actually see the yardstick trailing itself. That's not because I'm moving it super fast. It's because your visual memory is holding images here, 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 here. And it's holding it there so you know where it came from. And that's why it looks like you know, it's kind of fading from here to here. Okay? It can trail itself. So again, quickly wave a pencil back and forth in front of your face. Uh, do you see the fading image of the pencil trailing behind it? That is your visual sensory memory at work. Uh, it momentarily holds a snapshot of the environment, environmental image you see before it's almost instantaneously replaced by an overlapping image. Then you move on to your ears. That would be called echoic memory. So auditory sensory memory, brief memory like an echo. Your auditory sensory memory holds sound information for up to three to four seconds. That means that you don't even have to think about remembering it for three to four seconds. So this is the classic case of a kid or a student getting asked a question by a teacher uh, and the question usually would go something like, what did I just say? Because you're expecting the student because they weren't paying attention. Um, and they weren't paying attention? Oh. Hold on, everybody. Pause. Uh, of course. I didn't get there in time. Three rings. Three. Ball and teacher. Does that happen again? I'm sorry for the interruption. The phone rang three times, then I went to answer it, and nobody was there. Because I'm across the room teaching. All right, so uh, this brief auditory sensory trace for sound allows you to hear speech as continuous words or a series of musical notes as a melody. So, you know, you can make sense of the sentences that I'm actually saying because your auditor auditory sensory system keeps it there for you. Okay, it's just not like word by word by, by word. It's really, you get the, you have three to four seconds of a buffer to always understand what was being said. Um, so it also explains why you're able to remember something that you momentarily don't hear as an example of a family member asking you where the phone book is or something like that. That's a book example from our book. But a class example would be a teacher saying to a student that they think that is not paying attention, what did I just say? And then you would rattle that off. You would say what they just said. And that's not because you were listening. That's because your echoic memory hadn't replaced that information yet. You have three to four seconds to spit that information back to the teacher. And what the teacher should do would be wait three to four seconds, give silence, and then say, hey, what did I just say? Then it would be very difficult for that kid or student to respond. So who studied this? Um, a guy named George Sperling. Okay? Um, so American psychologist who identified the duration of visual sensory memory in a series of classic experiments in 1960. So let's look at these experiments. So George Sperling exposed people to 1 20th of a second view of a grid of letters, followed by a tone which told them which row of letters to pull from iconic memory and recall. Without the tone, people recalled about 50% of the letters with the tone recall for any of the rows was typically at least 75%. Now, that might be a little confusing for you, but to simulate Sperling's experiment, notice the three rows of letters below. Based on the color of the letters, you will know. What's that?
No more interruptions, please. I'm trying to teach an online class. <laughs> Okay, to simulate Sperling's experiment, notice the three rows of letters below. You won't see them. They're actually going to pop up right here, okay? So based on the color of the letters, you will know that you must recall one of the following rows, and we're talking about rows, okay? Not columns. So if all the letters are gold or yellow, you'll remember the top row, okay? If all of the letters are blue, meaning the whole grid, you would remember the middle row. And if all of the letters are black, you're going to remember the bottom row. Now, what George Sperling would do was he would play a tone for this. Um, we don't have that the, the ability to play a tone, so it would be like the high-pitched tone. You'd remember the top row, the medium-pitched tone. You'd remember the middle, and then the low-pitched tone would be the bottom. We're going to do it with colors. Okay, so when I count to three, you'll see a grid of letters pop up here. If it's yellow, remember the top. If it's blue, remember the middle. If it's black, remember the bottom. In three, who, one. Now, that was very, very quick, wasn't it? That was super quick. Now, the thing is, if you were watching it specifically, you're like, okay, all right, I'm just going to take this in. You know, I'm, I'm looking for letters. I'm looking for letters. Check this out. If you didn't look for letters and you just focused right here and you just said, okay, pick this image up, pick this image up, and then trust in your iconic memory that you could actually access that information very quickly afterwards, that's when you could probably do it. But if you're looking for individual letters as I said that was going to happen, then you wouldn't. So let's check out these letters one more time. Boom. P, G, S, Z. So that is just a little, I guess, version of George Sperling's iconic memory experiment. Okay, so if it goes from sensory memory to the next stage, the next stage is called short-term memory. So short-term memory, the active stage of memory in which information is stored for up to about 20 seconds. That's not a long time either. So it allows for you to make sense of, the sen of this sentence while you read the rest of this sentence. Short-term memory is awesome. Okay? I mean, you start read I mean, you reading anything is short-term memory. You get to remember what you just read as you continue on, um, you know, and you keep it there temporarily. So maintenance rehearsal is key here. So the mental or verbal repetition of information in order to maintain it beyond the usual 20 second duration of short term memory. Uh, information that is not rehearsed is rapidly lost, fades away or decays, and we'll actually see that. Um, the memories, if you do not use them, they will stop working and it will be harder and harder for you to get that information back out of your brain. So it fades away, decays with the passage of time, so, uh, you know, they say what? Time heals all? I mean, if you have a bad memory, then yeah, it, it really will. I mean, time will heal it because if you decide not to remember it anymore or you get to a point where you don't think about it anymore, it will fade away. It will decay. So, interference from competing information can also have an effect on short-term memory. New information usually bumps out or displaces currently held information. So, George Miller, not George Sperling, <coughs> says you can hold seven plus or minus two bits of information in short-term memory. Seven plus or minus two. You might see it like this on a test. You might see it on a quiz like this. You might see it on the AP exam like this. Seven plus or minus two. But what are we truly talking about? Five to nine. Five to nine bits of information for a human. That is our maximum abilities in short-term memory. So, uh, there are ways to increase the amount of information you can hold, and that's called chunking. So, increasing the amount of information that can be held in short-term memory by grouping related items together in a single unit or chunk. That's why credit card numbers are the way they are. They're chunked into four four-digit numbers or telephone numbers. 
right? Social security numbers. So, if some information is selected from sensory memory to be sent to short-term memory, how much information can we hold? We know that that is 7 plus or minus 2. So more recent research suggests that an average person, free from distraction, can hold about 7 digits, 6 letters, or 5 words in their short-term memory for 20 seconds. So, test. Let's see how many of these letters and numbers you can recall after they disappear. No need for a hyphen before the V. So, you will see uh, right here a string of letters appear and disappear, all right? And I want you to try to remember them without writing them down. You can write them down after you see them. So here we go. Now I would write those down as fast as I possibly could. And my guess is you didn't get all of them. But if you did, you're pushing the maximum amount of bits of information that you can hold in your mind. So again, we have V, M, 3, C, A, Q, 9, L, D. So it's hard to chunk those letters anyways. So, you know, you would just have to go one at a time. And once you say one of them in your head, then it kind of replaces the other, and you struggle with this. This is a short-term memory problem. All right, so chunking. So why are credit card numbers broken into groups of four digits? Four chunks are easier to encode, memorize, and recall than 16 individual digits. Uh, so memorize these. Let's do it again. It would be almost impossible to memorize those things because they're not chunked for us already. We'd have to do it ourselves. So chunking, organizing data in a manageable unit. So let's look at this again. So maybe this would be a little bit easier because they're chunked right into a series of you know three letters at a time. But there's even an easier way to do this. Chunking works even better if we can assemble information into meaningful groups. So these are the same letters you've just seen before, but now look at them. Those probably make more sense to you because they're a little bit more meaningful, right? I don't know, KFC, FBI, BA, which would be, I guess, bachelor's degree, NAACP, uh, CVS, SUV, rolling on the floor laughing, NBA, and poor Q and X just don't give no love. All right, so <clears throat> there we go. All right, so from short-term memory to working memory, um, working memory is kind of the tools that you use in short-term memory. So working memory, the temporary storage and active conscious manipulation of information needed for complex cognitive tasks, such as reasoning, learning, and problem solving. So we have the phonological loop, the visuospatial sketch pad, and the central executive that guides it all. So the phonological loop is kind of easy to understand because you've done it. So specialized for verbal material such as lists of numbers or words. This is the aspects of working memory that is often tested by standard memory tasks. Um, before cell phones, there's a time where um, you had to remember phone numbers in your mind, right? Um, it's hard to kind of understand that uh, you should definitely have some phone numbers memorized these days, but uh, you know I don't. You know, I have tons of non-working phone numbers still in my head. So uh, a little story: first phone number I ever got, you know, from a uh, potential special lady friend. Went to the Jamboree in 1999, the BB&T Jamboree, best bank in town. If you didn't know what that stand stands for. Um, so go to the Jamboree. Back then, you go to the Jamboree because you know everybody in the county is going to be there. So ten, pretty much 10,000 students, 10,000 kids are going to be there at Legion Stadium. And you're going to go and you're going to watch these football games. But you're not going to watch these football games. You're going to talk to other people. That's what it was all about. It actually happened right before school started. So that was the kickoff to the entire school year. So I go there with my buddy Alex. We're walking around. Um, we ended up talking to this group of girls. This, this girl named Lauren gives me her phone number. 
and it's you know 7921227 or something like that. And I walked around that jamboree for hours repeating that phone number in my head so I could call it the next night. Hours. I didn't have a pen because why would you bring a pen to the football jamboree? You know, my mom gave me $20 so I could buy some popcorn and a drink. Couldn't even drive yet. Got dropped off there. So that's what final logical loop is. 792-1227, 792-1227, 792-1227. You work with it, you work with it, you work with it. And hopefully you set it enough where it becomes a part of your, well, a longer than short-term memory, but gets a little bit into long-term memory, and it has, it was, and it has always stayed there, okay? Um, Physio-spatial sketch pad is pretty simple to understand as well, specialized for spatial or visual material. So humans uh, were amazing at visio-spatial stuff. If you can access and create things for yourself to understand uh, not what things are, but where things are, your studying would increase tremendously. So let's say that you know I was studying for a test, and so maybe this is a good answer to your question earlier. If I was studying for a test, I'd create a poster, and I would put, put uh, different terms in different places and draw pictures and all that kind of stuff, and I would study that. And then all of a sudden you're asking yourself not the question of what is this answer, but where was this answer, and where is so much... Uh, it's, it's ingrained in us, right? I mean, you've got to think, of, uh, I've said it a million times, we're dealing with ancient hardware in a modern world. If we can access our ancient, you know, abilities uh, in this new modern world, we'd probably be better, you know, rememberers, okay? Um, because we needed to know where things were, not what things were, uh, you know, previously, evolutionarily speaking. So remembering the layout of a room or a city. Um, you know, uh, again, you, if you could access that, if you could create that, I mean, I didn't know I was doing this in college, but I did this. Um, so I would study for a test in history or whatever it was, and uh, I would be cramming, just like everybody, everybody says they don't cram, but they do. So, boom, I'm cramming. Uh, it's about two hours before the test, and I get desperate. So I start writing answers all over my body. Write it on my arm. Write it on my leg. Write it, you know, on my torso somewhere. Then I get in there, and I actually begin the test. And I'm taking the test, I'm taking the test, I'm taking the test, and I never look at anything on my body. Because when 